जी बिस्मिल्लाह रहमान रहीम वी आर स्टार्टिंग लेक्चर नंबर फोर एंड दिस लेक्चर नंबर फोर इज अबाउट द अगेन ग्रोथ थ्योरी वी विल बी लुकिंग एट द सोलो ग्रोथ मॉडल एंड दिस पर्टिकुलर लेक्चर दिस मेन सोर्स ऑफ दिस पर्टिकुलर लेक्चर इज द मटेरियल फ्रॉम द इंट्रोडक्शन एंड एंड द सोलो मॉडल बाय जॉर्ज मैरियोस and jeletos and he is the faculty of uh, the university mit uh, he belongs to department of economics of mit the massachusetts institute of technology usa and uh, he has written a lot of uh, good stuff about this solo model and we will be taking a lot of of detail from his lecture uh, and this lecture is about the introduction and the solo model by george marios now Uh, if you uh, look at the real world uh, we have got of course uh, a lot of things happening around uh, we have got uh, to look at the gdp how the gdp is changing how overall consumption levels are moving how the investments are changing over the time how the employment levels are uh, changing or fluctuating over time how the unemployment is moving and they are all the data basically that concern uh, to the macroeconomists you as a macroeconomist have to have a very good eye on how your output consumption investment employment and unemployment are moving and uh, that basically uh, show or create some kind of patterns like say for example you know like some countries have uh, gradually become developed uh, some countries have gradually become stronger and very a lot stronger over the time uh with the with the growth in all these uh, variables and these patterns basically are are different for the different nations like say for example for some of the nations uh they are the positive uh, like you know uh, changes happening into the gdp and their investments are rising their unemployments are falling uh, they are basically are creating more employment opportunities whatever growth they get uh, this growth is not a jobless growth they are creating jobs and they are basically progressing so if you look at the trends into different economies you will find that like you know these countries are doing well and some countries are not doing well like say for example uh, there are some countries in which like you know they haven't had growth for the last many decades like say for example like sub saharan african economies some of the sub saharan african economies uh, and some of the east asian economies as well and there are a lot of uh, basically you know like uh, uh, differences between the nations as far as the growth both employment consumption and everything is concerned now uh, this uh, uh, you know like uh, here is like say for example you have got a time series pattern uh, and during booms and recessions output consumption investment employment all move together in the same direction uh, you know like the variables that you talk about uh, from the perspective of the business cycle some of the variables are called as pro cyclical and some of the variables are called counter cyclical and some of the variables are called acyclical uh, the pro cyclical are those variables that move with the cycle like say for example you know what happens with the output when you're uh, you are in a boom it increases what happens with your consumption it increases what happens with your investment it increases what happens with your uh, kind of employment like you know it increases and there are so many variables which are pro cyclical and some variables are counter cyclical like say for example an employment is a counter cyclical like say for example if you are uh, in a boom an employment falls if you are in a slump your employment and employment rises uh, similarly you know like your trade deficits your current account deficits and there could be very so many variables that are counter cyclical counter cyclical means that your economy is going up they are going down your economy is going down they are going up like you know of course like you know there are some negative variables which actually change over the time and uh, again you actually have got a pattern in the cross section like say for example you can find like you know the richer countries have got more capital like say for example if you take a cross section of so many countries rich countries specifically you will witness that like you know they are basically winning because of the capital they have so they basically have got a lot of capital now understanding what lies beneath or behind these all patterns uh and driving lessons can guide the policy and this is a job of the macroeconomist like you are getting training here uh, when you study macroeconomics you basically have to learn what actually is happening behind these all variables what actually are making them move like say for example what are causing them to rise to rise and what are causing them to fall 
and uh, uh, understanding for the formal economist uh, does not mean only telling the story like you know you don't have to write the blogs but you have to write uh, or you have to present solutions for it and that's what is a basic task for the macroeconomist now there are different models which basically have tried to do that like say for example they have not only looked at the patterns they have not looked at just like you know they have not only given the qualitative statements in their blogs or they have not written into the newspapers only about the problems but what they have done basically they have created uh, a kind of models which basically you know like uh, which models that basically mimic uh, certain aspects of the world uh, mimic means they represent the certain aspects of the world like you know say for example when they uh, make a model uh, they actually study the households and firms now basically like say for example if you recall uh, the simple uh, macroeconomic model uh, in which you have got like you know firm and household the very basic model in the macroeconomics is a two sector model in which like say for example what the firms provide to the household the goods and services and what households give them in return for them the money the expenses which they make on the goods and services and similarly the households provide them uh, like you know labor and what the firms provide them uh, the wages similarly the household provide them capital and what the firms provide them in return in trust so this is what basically is a kind of a cycle that basically you study in your macroeconomics basically you know like the very first model and your macroeconomics is a two sector model in which you study the uh, like you know like you know study the uh, what is it called the uh, a kind of uh, uh, circular flow of income and you know in a similar way there are so many models that have studied the behavior of different households and firms and they basically try to uh, create a proxy for the real world people and businesses like you know how the people do and how the businesses respond how the people demand how the businesses respond how the businesses do and how the people respond to it so uh, and the people basically what whatever the choices they make that determine the economy like say for example what kind of choices the businesses make that determines uh, the production that determines that what actually your future directions would be and they are making choices whose product at the aggregate level is sometimes series of aggregate output and employment etc so we thus end up with a mathematical model that generates the kind of time series we also observe in the real world and by figuring out how these time series are generated in the model we hope uh, to also understand some of the forces behind the actual macroeconomic phenomena like say for example why really a country is growing and why a really a country is not growing why employment level is increasing in some country why employment level is decreasing in some country why inflation is rising in the country why inflation is falling in some country like say for example again as we were debating about the we were actually making a political debate about pakistan the biggest problem that the current government of pakistan faces is inflation why inflation is rising and how this inflation is related to the uh, like you know inflation overall uh, in all the overall world how things are basically happening so in this particular lecture we will go uh, like you know over our first basic mathematical model of the macro economy which is a solo model uh you must have heard about robert solo like you know he got nobel prize in economics and he was uh, a guy basically like you know who is respected the most into the growth economic macroeconomics growth literature and he was the guy basically who gave the first ever uh, kind of a model like you know to the to the world like you know what makes economy grow what causes growth in the economy he learned about and he read about the the forces and factors and the components of growth and he was basically trying to like you know when he was explaining his models he was trying to explain that what really uh, like you know makes a country grow so we are going to look at the basic mathematical model of the macro economy uh, which is a solo model and we shall be using this model like you know to understand economic growth over time in the cross section of the countries why some countries grow and why some countries do not grow and you know like by the way this is the very important question that economists are trying to answer from the very beginning of the economics uh, like you know itself like say for example the first book which adam smith wrote uh, in 1776 was about uh, the nature and inquiry about the uh, like you know nature and cause of wealth of nations what he was trying with that particular kind of inquiry he was trying to inquire that why some nations have got more capital and why some nations have got less capital why some countries grow at higher rate and why some countries grow at a lower rate 
so he was trying to you know like try to find out like you know how basically things basically are moving and that's what basically uh, was the trying to like you know that is something was tried to answer like you know the solo tried to answer and he also tried to find out the reasons that why some countries grow at higher rate and why some countries grow at lower rate what makes a country grow and what makes a country like you know uh, recede so this is what something was the inquiry of uh, 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 solo and but we are also going to use this uh, standard uh, understanding of the economic fluctuation economic impact of various policies you know like when you study the growth like say for example if you are able to understand that how economy is progressing uh, you can also study the impact of shocks on that economy like say for example if some shocks come to that economy if somehow this economy is disturbed uh, because of some internal or external factors what actually uh, will happen into that economy what kind of uh, situations develop and how can you deal with these kind of shocks like say for example uh, we will be talking about two kinds of shocks uh, in the later part of our course and these shocks are related to the real business cycle and this real business cycle basically uh, shocks come in the terms of demand shocks or supply shocks generally we talk about the supply shocks and these supply shocks basically you know affect the the overall economy like say for example the supply shock can be a drought the supply shock can be a war like say for example there is a war going on uh, between russia and ukraine and this war actually is causing so much trouble for the overall world like say for example think about ukraine ukraine's output is falling ukraine's unemployment is rising ukraine uh, gdp is is like you know is is getting lower and lower over the time and why is this happening because of the external shock the war has been imposed on 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 ukraine and all the countries that had got a trading relationship with uh, ukraine or russia they are also getting affected this is the shock that is coming to the europe as well like say for example uh, you know that the ukraine provide or supply them wheat and ukraine provide them also the like say for example russia russia supplies gas to the european economies and if the russia uh, like say for example due to the imposition of sanctions and due to the imposition of bans this uh, gas supply has uh, actually reduced to the to the europe and this basically has caused a lot of trouble in the europe like you know and that is what external shock that comes to the economy that might affect their growth rate that might affect like say for example we have another very good example of this kind of a shock uh, which actually has uh, we have been recently over alhamdulillah with that like it's a pandemic covid 19 what did this covid 19 do with the economies of the world like you know the economies that are still struggling the economies that are still actually having trouble like you know getting over with this kind of a shock that happened uh, during this uh, this pandemic so these are kind of the supply shocks that happen what actually like you know happens with an economy when the supply shocks come do they get uh, like the stability back or they get unstable and just remain unstable forever what happens with them like you know and we are actually going to look at and do these analysis later on in this particular course and uh, all in all we will be looking at like you know how a very simple in fact ridiculously simple mathematical model can give us uh, a lot of insight about how the macro economy works so we will be looking at the solo model and we shall be looking at the simplest version of the solo model and we shall be trying to see that how macro economy works what makes an economy grow what makes an economy recede what actually increases employment in the economy what decreases employment in the economy what causes inflation in the economy what causes other kind of the problems in the economy so this is what something will be the the basic understanding of this and in particular we will be starting analyzing the model by pretending that there is a social planner uh, you know like the macro economy is not uh, and macro economics is not an easy economics to to study because uh, in the macro economics you don't have got one particular person you talk about like say for example as compared to in the in the micro economics in the micro economics you study the behavior of individual like say for example mr x as an individual household mr x as an individual like you know entrepreneur uh, mr like you know abc firm as an individual firm like you know xyz industry as an individual industry but when you talk about the macro economy you don't have got the freedom or liberty or you have got like provision of studying the single person like say for example when you study the macro economics you study the overall economy you study the economy as a whole and the economy consists of so many individuals the economy consists of so many firms the economy consists of so many industries the economy consists of so many sectors so like you know when you study macroeconomy 
or macroeconomics, you have to study all of these factors together. You have to see like, you know, what actually is going to happen in the economy when everyone is taking his decision. At the same time, like say, for example, when you are buying something, there are so many people who are other, there are so many other people who are also buying. There are so many other people who are selling. Or there are so many people who are staying at home. They are not coming to the market for buying or selling either. So there are a lot of decisions happening. Like say, for example, being a firm, what kind of a decision you take? It doesn't matter in the very big macro economy because like, you know, you are, kind of a very small part of the overall macro economy the what is happening in the in the overall country it's not happening because of you it's happening a lot of with a lot of factor due to a lot of factors that are happening so to make these things simple and to look at the basic uh, way the economy makes a decision we assume that this economy is governed by a dictator when an economy is governed by a dictator like say for example you know what is the worst thing about the martial laws in the martial law one person takes all decisions for the firm and if you compare this martial law with a with a parliamentarian system or the democracy you see like you know that so many people take decision together and their decision depends on the like you know say for example the the inputs from their constituency like say for example if i am an uh, MNA or I am an uh, I am a representative in the in the government in the democratic government. I have got like you know I have to answer so many people like you know I have to uh, go for the vote in the next election. I want to uh, like you know I just have to respond uh, to the needs of the people like you know who live into the, my constituency who have given me vote and send me to the parliament or or to the uh, to the assembly for making decisions about me. So. And this is very difficult decision, like, you know, the democracy, like, you know, there are so many people taking decisions, like decision depend on the will and the willingness of so many people. But what happens in the martial law, only one person takes a decision. So studying the decision of one person is a lot easier than studying decisions of everyone together. Like, say, for example, you know, like if you think about a, a, a country, say, for example, uh, populated by, like, you know, populated by five people, say, for example, if you are trying to see like, you know, everyone, you will not be able to get one particular idea about the decision making, how the overall economy is making decisions. So here, basically, you know, like to begin with, this is the simplest form of a, a like, you know, assumption that we assume that the economy is governed by social planner. Economy is governed by what? Social planner. And who is that social planner? Is the person who is a dictator like you know the one person is taking all decisions of consumption production and everything so we are actually going to assume that economy in particular we will be starting or analyzing the models by pretending that there is a social planner or benevolent dictator now, when we say benevolent benevolent actually means a person who actually like you know cares about the people who is not a kind of a person like you know who imposes his own willingness or who's who uh, own wills or own desires on the people like you know he thinks about the people but he's the only person who is taking the decision and that's why it is easy to study like you know how he maximizes the utility how he maximizes the production how he maximizes the welfare of the economy so in particular we will be starting analyzing the model by pretending that there is a social planner or benevolent dictator that chooses the static and intertemporal allocation of resources and dictates these allocations to the households and farms of the economy. What this dictator is doing, that he is choosing intertemporal allocation of resources. Uh, does anybody from you know the intertemporal allocation of resources? What do we mean by the intertemporal? So by the intertemporal allocation of resources, we mean uh, the allocation between the two periods or more than two periods, like, you know, and when you make a decision, in one period to uh, for the consumption and investments in the second period like you know that is called intertemporal allocation of resources so the benevolent dictator chooses static and intertemporal allocation of resources and dictates these allocations to the households and farms of the economy so he is like you know it is it gets a lot easier to study the macroeconomic model when you assume that the economy is being governed by individual people like you know individual person like you know who is a dictator and who is a social planner who plans for everybody, like, you know, who plans for the society, overall society. 
and that becomes quite easier like you know the macroeconomics becomes some similar to microeconomics basically when you study or when you have got this kind of assumption because like you know you are uh, having a situation when you are just looking at the one person's decisions about intertemporal allocation of resources and you are just like you know just looking at the decision of one person uh, for the future decision making and we shall also be looking at later on uh, that the allocations that prevail in the decentralized mar competitive market environment uh, coincide with like you know this is a centralized kind of an analysis that we begin with uh, but later on we shall also be looking at the decentralized economy and in that decentralized economy the households and firms will be taking their decisions separately and then we shall see like you know how similar those uh, like you know uh, how similar uh, the decisions or how similar the outcomes of the decentralized economy are with the, the centralized economy. So we'll be trying to create a kind of a comparison uh, between the centralized and decentralized economies. And we shall be seeing that like, you know, how uh, the centralized economy is similar to the decentralized economy. Okay. So uh, introduction and stylized facts about growth. Now, uh, say, for example, how can countries with low level of GDP per person catch up with high levels enjoyed by United States or G7? How can a country become developed? Uh, uh, if you look at this question, how can countries with low level of GDP per person catch up with the high levels enjoyed by the big countries, like, say, for example, G7, the group of seven countries? or the group of uh, 27, 28 countries in OECD. Uh, and this is only possible with the help of high growth rate sustained for long periods of time. Like say, for example, look at China. What happened with China? Like, you know, say, for example, if you uh, read about China of like, you know, if you look, if you read about the China of 1960s, 1970s, or even 19, early 1980s, you will find many instances of people dying just because of hunger. You will find, like, you would find so many examples where actually there was everywhere poverty, there was everywhere, like, you know, helplessness. The economies was, was in shatters, like, you know, things were so bad. And there was, like, you know, no uh, scope or no growth was, uh, like, you know, uh, possible. Like, you know, it was not seemingly possible, like, you know, with the, with the conditions the, the Chinese economy was in. But somehow they started growing. Somehow they actually sustained their growth rates. And now the China's economy has become the second largest economy in the world. However, it has not become the developed economy as yet uh, because of some other factors. But like, you know, it has become so big, like, you know, that the GDP or the economic output of this country in terms of PPP is the second largest in the world. And it is very like, you know, uh, likely that over some time, like, you know, the, the China will beat US in terms of the economic growth, in terms of economic output, like say, for example, GDP. So and what happened with the, U, with the China, basically? China sustained growth rate of more than 10% for three decades. And somehow the economy that was in shatters, the economy that was in trouble, like, you know, the economy that was uh, not doing uh, well at all, like, you know, just somehow recovered and somehow get, like, you know, into the mainstream. And now it has become the second largest economy in the world. And small differences in the growth rates over long periods of time can make huge difference. You know, like, um, uh, you, you must have learned about the, the power of compounding. Like, say, for example, the US per capita GDP grew by a factor of 10 from 1870s to 2000. In 1995 price, it was $3,300 in 1870 and it was $32,500 in 2000. It increased by the factor of 10, 10 times the per capita income in the US increased. And how was that possible? Uh, that actually became possible that average growth rate of the US was just 1.75%. Just 1.75%. If US had grown with 0.75%, like India and Pakistan, or the Philippines, its GDP would be only $8,700 in 1990. That is one fourth of the actual one, similar to Mexico, less than Portugal and Greece. 
All right. So average growth rate, if US would have like would have got the growth rate like it grew by 1.75 percent, if it would have grown by 0.75 percent, it would have been like worse than Pakistan, India, Portugal, Greece, and a lot of big a lot of economies. But if you think like one percent more, if US had grown with 2.75 percent, like Japan and Taiwan at this time. Its GDP would have been 11, 111, 12,000 per capita in 1990, and that is 3.5 times the actual one. So you can imagine, like you know, that 1.75 percent, 1 percent less could take it into the deep down poverty and deep down problems, and 1 percent more they could take it to it's like a lot bigger economy, a lot stronger economy, a lot uh, like you know bigger uh, GDP per capita. So you can imagine, like you know, but that is what basically is only possible when you have growth and this growth sustains for a long period of time. What has been happening with Pakistan and the countries like Pakistan that we generally have got spikes of growth. Like sometimes like, you know, say for example, if you look at the growth rates of uh, uh, countries, like say for example, like Pakistan, you find big spikes, but, spikes, but these spikes are not able to sustain for so long. You have got a very high growth rates in some periods, but that growth rate you are not able to sustain. That growth rate is supposed to fall, and then you have a spike. But then you again you go and like that is quite a, just a topsy turvy way of the growth. Like you know, and what actually makes the developing countries different from these countries is that like you know, the developing countries are not able to sustain growth rate for a long period of time, but America did. So uh, once we appreciate the importance of sustained growth, the question is natural: what do can do to make growth faster. Equivalently, the question could be what are the factors that explain differences in economic growth and how can we control these factors? All right. Uh, while we are talking about these questions, what exactly really want to achieve? We want to achieve, we want to achieve, or I want to make your mind and this particular uh, kind of article is trying to make your mind. Uh, to understand the importance of growth and to just know that what basically the growth theories do. So these quest answers basically that we have, that have been asked to you, like, you know, like say for example, what can do, what can we do to make growth faster and how can these factors uh, can be controlled. Uh, these are the, like, you know, the basic uh, kind of the objectives of the growth theories that have been given by Solo and other kind of people. So in order to prescribe policies that will promote growth, we need to understand what are the determinants of economic growth, as well as what are the effects of economic growth on social welfare. We want to know the determinants of economic growth. We want to know the, like, you know, what are the effects of economic growth on social welfare? You know, like growth uh, is not always beneficial for, for everyone. The growth always, you know, like does not create a kind of a just society. The growth always does not create a kind of a society where everyone is equal. Like, you know, there are so many societies that basically are growing, but inequality is also growing in that. Like say, for example, even if you talk about the USA, USA is one of the biggest economies in the world. It is the most uh, strong, uh, the strongest economy uh, in economic terms, basically all over the world. But if you look at the income inequality in the US, like you, know, you will be amazed to see that like in the top 1% of the population in the US actually have a hold of 20% of the GDP of the US. So you can imagine that how unequal this distribution is, that 1% is getting the 20% income of the overall country, you know, like that is a huge number, that's a huge amount, uh, because they have got very, very big billionaires who actually get the most of the uh, most part of this growth. And that is what something you need to know, like, you know, how this growth affects the social welfare, how this affects the welfare of the overall society, how it affects poverty. Like, say, for example, in Pakistan, we have had so many episodes of growth but what actually has happened with the poor, with that growth? The poor have not changed. The poor, the lives of the poor have has not changed. They are actually still poor. They are still struggling for basic uh, necessities. They are still struggling for basic things. Like say, for example, if the finance minister comes to the TV, uh, comes on the TV and he just uh, actually gives a speech that Pakistan has had growth of 5.5%, but a person who is uh, whose children actually are sleeping hungry uh, and the people like, you know, who are not able to buy food because they actually cannot afford that food uh, for them, these numbers are meaningless numbers. These numbers are useless. These are numbers are like, you know, they basically are just mimicry, like, you know, from the uh, people like, you know, and that is what something uh, and that actually is like 
like in making fun of their their lives basically they are uh, struggling they are still not able to uh, like you know afford a uh, food and like you know basic necessities in their lives and the governments are talking about growth the governments are talking about the number of cars being sold now governments are talking about number of bikes are being sold so you can imagine that what kind of a mindset or what kind of like you know response or or the reaction would come from a person who is hungry for two days and if the if he listens to the chief minister i'm sorry the finance minister of the country that like you know pakistan has been able to sell that many cars during the issues years so it means that we are progressing we are growing so it doesn't mean anything for him so that is exactly what uh, where growth theories come into picture and uh, uh, as we mentioned before in 2000 there were many countries that had much lower standards of living than the united states and this fact reflects the high cross country dispersion in the disparity amongst the the countries and the the regions so according to barrow uh, robert barrow Robert J Barrow the distribution of gdp per capita in 2000 across the 147 countries in summers and hastens data set the richest country was luxembourg with 44000 dollars gdp per per person like you know in 2000 the luxembourg was the richest country in terms of the gdp per capita the united state came second like you know in 2000 with 32500 dollars per capita income seven and the most of the oecd countries ranked in the top 25 positions together with singapore Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Cyprus. Most African countries, on the other hand, fell in the bottom 25 of the distribution. Tanzania uh, was the poorest country with only $570 per person, like you know, as a, a GDP per capita. That is less than 2% of the income in the United States and Luxembourg. Can you imagine that? Like, you know, on average, people in the Tanzania basically were earning 2% of the average income of the people, like you know, in in the USA and Luxembourg. so if you look at the distribution in the 1960s uh, across 130 countries for which the data are available the richest country then was switzerland uh, and at that point of time its per capita income was $15000 uh, per person per annum the united states was again the second with $13000 and the poorest country was again tanzania uh, with $450 Uh, the cross country dispersion of the income was thus as wide in 1960s as in 2000 like you know this was has not changed uh, in 1960s also like you know there was a huge difference between the top uh, rich countries and top like you know the lowest uh, poor country nevertheless there were some important movements during this 40 year period argentina venezuela uruguay israel and south africa were in the top 25 in 1960s but none made it to the top in 25 in 2000 so that is what something was happening behind the scene the disparity was there but some countries were able to make progress and some countries were not able to make progress on the other hand china indonesia nepal uh, pakistan india and bangladesh uh, grew fast enough to escape the top bottom uh, like you know bottom 25 countries uh, between 1960s and 1970s so pakistan was doing well during the 1960s so pakistan somehow came out of the list of the lowest 25 uh, countries in the world so these large movements in the distribution of income reflects sustained differences in rate of economic growth different countries like you now say for example so uh, you know like uh, the mean growth rate was 1.8% per annum that is the world on average uh, was twice as rich in 2000 as in 1960s so the growth rate increased to 1.8% on average for the overall world the united states is slightly better than the mean the fastest growing country was taiwan at that point of time and the slowest growth was happening in zambia okay so you can read about it like you know the most asian most east asian countries singapore taiwan singapore south korea hong kong thailand china and japan together with botswana cyprus romania and mauritius had the most stellar growth performance like you know they were growing so you know like what this picture is presenting you know like there were some countries which were making places in the top countries and some picking some countries were actually losing those places and they were going into the down down bottom countries so you need to understand their experiences you need to see how the countries that have come out of the poverty like you know have been able to do that and how the countries basically who were not able to sustain uh, you know like the the growth rates how they have been doing now if you look at the stylized facts when you talk about the stylized facts the stylized facts are basically the presentation of empirical findings uh, and generally they are uh, like you know uh, they, they are uh, broad tendencies that aim to summarize the data 
So stylized facts is a simplified presentation of an empirical finding. So whatever you have found empirically, if you present that in a simplest way, that is called the stylized fact. And there are so many stylized facts of that particular time period as far as the growth is concerned. Now, the first stylized fact is the first finding based on the empirical results of different researches is that, that in the short run, important fluctuations, output, employment, investment, and consumption vary a lot across booms and recessions. During recessions and booms, your output, your employment, your investment, everything actually changes quite considerably. In the long run, balanced growth, output per worker and capital per worker, grow at roughly constant and certainly not vanishing rate. So in the long run, this is a stylized fact. That is a summary of the empirical findings that like growth, actually like you know, the economies grow at a constant rate and they do not grow at a zero rate, but they grow at a constant rate. The change in the growth rate can be zero, but their growth rate is generally a positive thing. Uh, the third uh, could be the substantial cross-country differences in both income levels and growth rates exist. And there are persistent differences versus conditional convergence. Like, you know, I was telling you in the earlier class as well, that there were so many economists who predicted convergence. The convergence they predicted on the grounds that like, say, for example, the developed countries are such which have got more capital and less labor and developing countries are such which have got more labor and less capital. So according to the law of diminishing returns concept, the returns of the capital into the developed countries should be lower as we have got so much so low returns of the labor like you know in the developing countries so what should happen the capital should move from the developed countries where the return is lower to the developing countries where the returns should be higher because the capital is scarce in the developing countries similarly the labor move from the developing countries to developed countries because the return of to the labor in the developing countries is low and the return in the, of the developed labor in the developed countries is very high. So what they predicted, like, you know, the labor should flow fly or flow from the developing countries to developed countries and capital should flow from the developed countries to developing countries. So if the capital flows from the developed countries to developing countries, there should be some kind of convergence between the growth rates because the movement of capital will increase the productivity of labor that will increase the output and that will increase the GDP of the country. But that did not happen as we have learned. So there are some kind of convergences happen, but still there are some kind of distinct differences exist. And that is what is a stylized fact. Again, fact based on the data. The data shows, the theory shows that this is possible, but the data shows that actually still uh, differences persist between uh, different countries. Formal education uh, is highly correlated with high levels of income. If you actually have got more educated people, you can actually increase the income of a country because of this, uh, like, you know, uh, use of science and technology and uh, different kinds of techniques. So highly correlated with high levels of income together with the differences. R&D, the research and development and information technology is the most powerful engine of growth, uh, but requires high skills at first place. Of course, you need to have high skills if you want to go for R&D and IT. Government policies, taxation, infrastructure, inflation, law enforcement, property rights, and corruption are important determinants of growth performance. Like how you define your current taxation structure, how do you define your infrastructure, what kind of inflation you have got that defines that how, what kind of performance you have got. Another stylized fact, another fact based on the empirical data is that an inverted U-shaped relationship, that is autocracy and are bad for growth. Like say, for example, you know, you must have heard about this that the worst democracy, the worst democracy is better than the best martial law. And that is what has been proven, uh, like, you know, empirically as well, that there is an inverted U-shaped curve. And when we say inverted U-shaped curve, this is a curve like this. So this is inverted U-shaped curve uh, exists and the relationship, this relationship exists between, uh, like, you know, growth and autocracy. Autocracy means, of course, the dictatorship. Openness, uh, like, you know, uh, and financial integration promotes growth, uh, but not necessarily if it is between the North and the South. Like, you know, of course, if there is a difference between the nations, one is powerful and the other is less powerful, uh, then again, the powerful gets a more benefit. Inequality, the Kuznet curve, uh, basically like, you know, defines that how your GDP per capita increase actually leads to 
unequal or equal curve distribution the kuznet curve namely an inverted u shaped curve relationship between inequality and gdp per capita exists fertility like you know say for example you know that high fertility rates correlate with levels of income and low rates of economic growth in pakistan the fertility rate is around 3.2 every woman in pakistan on average give birth to 3.2 children during her reproductive age so it's a very very big number uh, as compared to other nations so that is why our population growth rate is, is very high another very important uh, empirical finding over the over the time is that financial markets and risk sharing banks credit stocks and like you know and insurance companies are definitely important uh, for the growth uh, structural transformation should be there agriculture should be transformed into manufacture and services what has happened in pakistan that pakistan has jumped from the agriculture sector to services sector and we have missed this manufacturing uh, activity altogether which should not have been missed urbanization family production organized production small villages big cities extended domestic trade like you know there is urbanization taking place and other institutional factors that can be responsible for the growth like colonial history ethnic uh, heterogeneity and social norms are all actually very important so 